Welcome, y'all. Welcome. We were just hearing from Rising Appalachia, and welcome to the Southern Movement Assembly call. Um, this is our September call, and uh, we're really excited to have you all here. We've got um, ASL Interpretation. Thank you, Juan, um, for holding that. And I believe we might have some Spanish language interpretation. So just want to pass that to, to Wendy as we're getting, getting our accessibility together. Good evening, y'all. Yes, we do have Spanish and ASL interpretation today. Thank y'all so much. Wendy, she and hers come from the lands of the Choctaw in central Mississippi. And um, we want to thank Kakoa for doing our inter interpretation tonight. And I'm about to turn on the interpretation link. It'll be the globe at the bottom of your Zoom. And that will be interpretation from Spanish to English. And it is turning on now. Awesome. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Wendy, for securing our, our Spanish language. Um, my name is Stephanie Gilliu. I'm one of the co-directors of Project South based in Atlanta. I use she pronouns and one of the anchor reps to the Governance Council. And I'm proud to be co-facilitating tonight with Nikki Brown, with Spirit House, um, another anchor organization of the Southern Movement Assembly. Um, and together we're, we're excited to, to be with all of you and, and making it happen. Um, if you're on the computer, um, and welcome to the folks on the phone. Um, we're psyched to have everybody. We've had over 100 folks are registered for tonight's call, so we'll share the recording afterwards. Um, we think it's going to be a good one. But if you're on the computer, type in your name, your pronouns, your organization, and, and where you're where you're calling in from. Um, and specifically, just want to remind everybody that on last month's call, Ida with the Bulbancha Collective um, in Louisiana, she challenged us to research the indigenous name for the place we live and the meaning of that name. So we just wanted to circle back. Um, Ida, they put that challenge out. Um, and so we just wanted to see if you if you did your research and you know the name, uh, the indigenous name for the place you live and the meaning of that name, please throw it into the chat as well. And as we're doing this, um, just reminders that we are recording. Um, and we will email this recording to all who registered and we'll get it up on the website um, so that folks can share in the Skillshare and knowledge. Um, if you're on the phone or computer, please mute if you're not talking to reduce sound interference. And if you're tweeting or posting, please use hashtag Southern People's Power when you're posting. Um, and welcome to folks seeing everybody. It's great um, to have you all here tonight. And so tonight we are going to be doing um, something special, a Skillshare um, with Spirit House based in Durham, North Carolina. And it's a Skillshare based on the organizing fundamentals. And we've been doing Skillshares like this for the last year or two. And the 2021 SMA action plan that we developed together collectively at SMA 9 in November of 2020, we named three goals to protect our people, to disrupt capital, and to build infrastructure. And the organizing example that Spirit House is gonna share with us tonight hits all three goals. We're excited to learn more about the American Rescue Plan Act, those funds and how they're hitting all of our communities, how to research, analyze, organize, and propose really big solutions that are community controlled. Since COVID began, we've watched billions and trillions of public dollars, our dollars, move without any real accountability or transparency. Where did the money go? How much went to community-informed public health infrastructure versus pharmaceutical companies? How could these dollars be better used to shore up our preparation, our response, and our recovery to climate disasters like we're witnessing with Ida, Hurricane Ida in uh, Louisiana and Mississippi? Or how could we create harm-free zones that Spirit House has been leading and training and facilitating for years now that could reduce the number of people getting locked up by police, by ICE, and other law enforcement? So one of the fundamentals 
of organizing is to inv investigate and research so that we can educate and activate our communities. And this crew is going to share skills, tools, and methods to do that investigation and data research work to build strong visionary proposals for this opportunity, unprecedented opportunity that we all face with this particular set of funding hitting our towns and counties all over the country, but without necessarily all of the infrastructure that we need to be able to claim and move and redistribute these resources in the places and visions that we know we need. Um, so we're going to learn a little bit about how they're doing it so that we can then do it in our places. So we know there's going to be a lot of questions and ideas rolling. Um, so please put them in the chat. We'll catch them and we'll do the best we can to answer. Um, and uh, the Spirit House crew has been really generous and they agreed to stay on the call for an extra sort of 15 minute bonus round at the 7.30 or 6.30 hour, at the end of the hour. Um, just so if we wanna get into a little bit more nitty gritty, they're the ones to talk us through it. And so they've agreed to that little bonus round. And so definitely write your questions down, take notes. Uh, we will be recording, pop them in the chat. We'll try to circle back around um, and I'm gonna kick it back over to Nikki Brown my co-facilitator and comrade. Hi, y'all. It's good to see you. I'm Nikki Brown. I am, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am here in Whitaker's North Carolina, also known as Tuscarora Land. Um, and I'm excited tonight because I get to introduce two of my best friends in the whole universe. Um, Afia Carter and Kanita Stringer Stanbeck, who are brilliant and amazing people. Um, they have a research based firm called Alphabet Crew with a K. Um, and they're in Durham, North Carolina, and they are going to share some awesome information with us about ARPA. They are part of the Spirit House family. And I love them so much. And I hope that you all learn as much from them as I do. It's on you guys. OK, thank you, Nikki Brown. Yes, one of our um, most treasured individuals on the planet. Um, my name is Afia Carter. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and um, unfortunately, I didn't know the assignment about knowing exactly where I am. I do know that I am in a place that I've lived for 40 years. Um, <clears throat> and I live in a community um, that is not too far, well, that is a block away from North Carolina Central University. And our community is also known as the Haytai community. Um, which at one point in time enjoyed what was called the Black Wall Street. Um, as Nikki stated, I am one half of Alphabet Crew, and we do um, research-based approaches to a lot of things, but in particular, we look at the intersections of public administration, public policy, Black history, um, librarianship, and information science. Um, so in this particular instance, what we were looking at is the fact that um, the American Rescue Plan Act uh, came through or is coming through our area and we embarked upon a project and a coalition in order to look at how those funds are being distributed. So at this point, I'll go ahead and share my screen hopefully my voice is not too soft because i do have a soft voice if i need to speak up just let me know and i will hide that okay can everyone see this Yes, we can. Now, yes. um, I'm going to sign out and sign back in because location services took us off. Oh, yeah. Thank you.
Can everyone else see? Yes. Okay. So what is ARPA? Uh, the American Rescue Plan Act is a 1.7 trillion stimulus bill that was passed in March of 2021. It has given $300 billion for states, counties, tribal governments, and municipalities to mitigate economic harm from COVID-19. And the use of funds is extremely broad. Um, it can be used to aid households. It can be used for small businesses, for nonprofits, and for specific industries. And um, state, state and local governments pretty much can do a, a, a lot of things. Um, with this money. Um, ARPA is significant because we haven't seen this amount of money um, poured into local government since the New Deal. And that is significant because at that particular time, policies and initiatives were, were passed and laws were passed that locked Black people um, largely out of that money. Um, and we're talking about redlining, we're talking about Jim Crow laws, there are a list of, of laws and, and policies and initiatives that were around at that particular time um, that locked Black people out of that, that money. Um, so ARPA, on the other hand, was written very broadly. So um, a lot of people, uh, well, businesses and and individuals and organizations that qualify for uh, this funding um, should not receive a lot of pushback as far as not being able to have access to the money. If they meet the basic qualifications, they should be able to have access according to what um, policymakers and lawmakers are doing in your particular area. Um, the guidance that has been given to uh, municipalities, which include from the ICMA, which is the International um, Association of, of Management Association for Cities and Counties, um, as well as the U.S. Treasury, has been to make sure that we are funding transformational and high impact projects and making sure also that folks that do not normally receive funding are receiving funding through ARPA. So um, this is just a little bit about the ARPA distribution guidance from PolicyLink. Um, one is to, they have 10 major goals for municipality, um, for municipalities. One is to name racial equity as a goal, to um, focus on good jobs and careers, to grow businesses, to engage historically underserved communities, um, to build civic infrastructure, to prioritize high impact equity investments, um, to track disaggregated data to ensure ac accountability, to prevent displacement, and to invest in COVID impacted communities. Um, Durham's plan for ARPA is that our city, so the city of Durham, is receiving approximately $50 million. The county of Durham is receiving another $60 million approximately, and then our school system is receiving around $160 million. Um, the way our process went out was that proposals were, um, they, they did an RFP for proposals beginning in March, and that proposal process closed in July. They're supposed to be reviewing those proposals right now. Um, the council is supposed to, the city council is supposed to vote uh, within the next uh, month or so. And, um, and then they should be uh, approving those proposals uh, relative by November. Um, the money is split up in two different sections. So they were given one pot of money and I think it was May and then they'll get another round of funding um, I think it is next year. Uh, the city also established a rubric for approval. They are establishing a committee. These are all things that we are watching in our city. Now for the county, 
of Durham, the county system is completely different than the city. The city set up a website, the county um, just set up their website within the last couple of weeks, even though the money has been here since May. Um, so that's something to think about is that in your particular area, uh, you may live in, uh, in a space where both city and county funds are coming to your area and the city's process or the town's process may be one thing and the county's process may be something different. Who is black, back in the black? So what we did was um, a, a couple of people who are familiar with the process of applying to um, applying for funds to local government and including one of our county commissioners uh, alerted some folks that this was happening and then we created a, a very broad coalition to just start looking at um, what ARPA funds were. So after we did that, we, we realized that we probably needed a coalition and we made our coalition extremely broad. So the coalition includes businesses, organizations, individuals. Um, and so that is really important because in certain cities and towns in your area, um, certain groups may be for, focused on certain things. We wanted to make sure that we were focusing on a very wide group of people. We started with looking at history. And so when we started looking at the historical data, we started looking at the racial wealth gap, right? And how our city had some mandates and, and, and work, like we, had a, we have a racial equity task force. We have a lot of verbiage that has come from both the city council as well as the mayor around reparations. We are also in a city where Duke University is and there are economic policy um, groups and forums and so forth that do um, a lot of projects and, and books and papers about, um, about racial equity. So we were pulling on that. Um, and when we looked at all of that data, we saw that about 38% of the firms in Durham are Black, and also 38% of our population is also Black. And so in order to push for an equity model, we asked for 45% of ARPA funds to be allocated to Black-owned and Black-led um, businesses, individuals, and organizations that uh, qualified for ARPA funds. Um, so we broke our, um, as I was saying before, we broke up our process into two separate processes. We did a lot of research first, and it was the research that informed the proposal. Um, sometimes we, in a movement, we're working on um, the individual, we're working on like a, um, a defining event or um, or a moment that has happened and so we're building um, messaging and proposals and so forth based on an event that has happened but what we did was we went back and made sure that we did a lot of research and pulled a lot of data from the bureau of labor and statistics from um from information around reparations and so forth and we made sure that we cited primary resources to back up everything that we were asking. So we cited the bill itself, not necessarily what the city, the city's interpretation of the bill was. We cited um, quantitative and qualitative research that, that we saw that was documented in order to make our proposal. We also asked for data accountability. Um, and so what that means is that we know that data can be used against us. And so we made sure that we asked for um, data collection to happen and that that collection be, ha be done by data scientists and uh, firms and groups that are black led or black owned. These are some of the coalition partners and organizations um, that signed on. We had one group, which is the group on in the in the 
darker blue box, that was the original group of, um, of organizations that helped to build the proposal. And then some of the other um, organizations that are in the lighter blue green box, those folks signed on afterwards. This is significant because we wanted to make sure that when we were going to our county commissioners and our city council that we were bringing with us the support of a lot of uh, of a, a wide cross section of people. Um, and so as you can see, a lot of people have really signed on to what it is that we um, what we're recommending. So this slide just shows you a little bit about how we again approached this um, this allocation of funding. And in particular, yes, we had to do a proposal. Yes, we submitted our proposal, a joint proposal. However, the equitable, equitable distribution um, of the funding is the thing that is most important to us. And it is essential that this money is allocated and distributed in a particular way. Why? Because at the end of, of the day, what we want to make sure of is that we are not on the wrong side of history, right? Um, his, historically, what we see is that there are these inequities. And what then happens is that it's not until after um, these things happen, do we then come back with sort of the historical analysis and data and all that stuff that supports what we already know is happening, which is that inequities exist and persist. So we are trying to make sure that whether our proposal is something that um, that our lawmakers accept or not, that the equitable distribution of the funding is what's most important. So we did that by making sure that we have both the coalition, but also the campaign. So the coalition, again, includes the nonprofit businesses, individuals, also academics and public servants. But then the campaign has a petition. We have other things that make sure that we get the word out to a lot of different people about the funds, about what it is that we're doing, and that um, that campaign is what also um, encourages the our city council and our county commissioners to look further into operationalizing what it is that we want to do. We really, really, really must impress upon everyone listening that none of this can happen without making sure that we include historical data, primary source documents, um, and looking at the existing in initiatives that the local government has already put out and making sure that we're tying what it is that we're saying to initiatives that the government has, that our local government has already supported. Um, our next steps are to continue to broaden our local coalition. And so we're looking at um, where we have um, done a little bit of talking to the city and the county, but, but basically what we're looking at is, is making sure that more people like you uh, know about these funds and um, get excited about finding out how what funds have come to your area and also get excited about organizing yourselves to figure out what your response is um, what your areas are some in some areas people are more focused on um, uh, people are focused on economic justice but they're also focused on the environment and environmental justice so clean water, clean air, that sort of thing. Maybe that's that's who you have on the ground on the ground working on things. Some people are working on police reform. Everybody is working on something different as far as where it is that they are. And so what we wanted to do is make sure that we told the story about what we're doing so that you all can have this on your radar, see how much funds um, are coming to your area, and then plugging that in as far as what makes sense for you. So just to um, go over again and to kind of close out, the American Rescue Plan Act was signed um, into law in March. Um, the act provides uh, several billion dollars um, to 
municipalities for um, a wide range of things. The first distribution of funds was in May. So your municipality may already have these, these funds and the second distribution will be next May. Um, all of these funds must be allocated by 2024 and they must all be spent by 2026. And that's it. Awesome. Are there any burning questions before Kanita gives a, a recap of what we learned? Awesome. There's lots of thank yous in the chat. Uh, Kanita, while folks are, are thinking about their questions and preparing to, to tap into them, would you like to give us a, somewhat of an overview of you know, what we just heard and how to apply it? And then I'll be happy to take folks into a little real-time research so that they can look up what funds have been allocated to their cities and counties. Okay, uh, so good evening, everyone. I am Kenita Stringer Standback. I do see a question. Um, Afia, do you wanna check, take this question? What was the coalition timeline and building tactics? Do you wanna um, answer that right? Yes, so we started the coalition in the middle of July and the deadline was July 31st to submit our proposal. So we had a very, very, very small window of time to build a very mighty coalition. Um, so I, so it was about two weeks, that, that's all we had. Um, and then our building tactics, again, were just to make sure that we had a very broad coalition. In Durham, um, Durham is a relatively progressive city, but we still have some breaks, if you will, um, where even though folks are voting, I think like 80% Democratic or something like that, there are still some divides and divisions. And so what we tried to do is we tried to make sure that we reached out you know, really far and wide um, one of the things that we talked about was just making sure that we weren't, um, that we were making sure that we framed our proposal to be extremely broad, to just sort of catch everyone who could, um, hi Mia, <laughs> who could, who um, could qualify for these funds because the reality is that the bill was written that way it was written extremely broad so there was no reason for us to go small with this so we we just tried to make sure you know who would normally be on the opposite ends of an issue and try to go really really broad in building the coalition so i see a ton of questions coming in one of the questions that just came in is um is how do you find how much money your county and city have? So Nikki, do you wanna like maybe show them the research thing first and then I can get into what we've seen and how to apply it because maybe if folks understand how to find their funding or what's going on in their, in their areas, then I can kind of step in and show them how to use kind of the stuff we've, we've come up with. You're on mute, my friend. And, and oh, actually, sorry. let me just say one thing, I, I just have, I was gonna just tell you guys a little bit about me is I'm a seventh generation North Carolinian, born and raised. Um, the land that we're on in Durham is uh, formerly or still Okanichi and Eno land. And I believe, now this is just cursory research um, since I've been on the call, but it seems to me that I found that the indigenous name of Durham was Ad Shushir. And it was a trading post here in North Carolina. Um, and uh, I just also want to throw out that, you know, our highway system and railroad system actually are built upon the trade routes that First Nations built across Turtle Island, which is also the name of, you know, what, where we live. In. Okay, so that's all I want to add. <laughs> I love it. 
see this this is what you get when one of your friends is a librarian you know they they look it up on the spot and want to tell you um i was gonna ask steph do you mind dropping the links in the chat for the um for the calculate you did it awesome that rocks so first we're going to take a look at the county calculator if you are able to open up that link from the chat so this calculator um, is called uh, american rescue plan estimated aid allocation um, by county um, and you will see there are two areas that we're interested in. One is the state. Um, and right now I'm looking at, I believe, Steph, you've entered Georgia as the state and the county as DeKalb County. Um, if you look directly under those two blocks, there's a block that says, treasury allocation. Now the treasury allocation for DeKalb County is, wow, oops, it went away. Uh, everybody's changing the thing. That's what happened. It's the state, yeah, state. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think we might be okay. flooding the Google Doc a little bit so we can everybody can use that link, but we might not be able to use it all at the same time. Exactly. <laughs> so I won't tell you amounts because everybody is playing around with it right now, but um, you will be able to see what your treasury allocation is. Um, you'll be able to see what the, the estimated ARPA per resident is, you'll see the population of your location and you'll be able to see um, what the first payment that your, your county received was and what the second payment is and when your county should receive it. Um, so that is helpful information. That's a good area to go to for a baseline of what your your county is working with and the link for the city is very much the same um, it's basically the same format um, it is a separate google document but the layout is essentially the same so i ask that you know not everybody at once but throughout the course of the evening you might want to look up what's been allocated and figure out what what do you want to do with it? What is it that you want to demand that your city, your county, your state does to actually alleviate some of the, the distress? Um, because not everybody is doing things in the process that Durham is doing them in. Um, as Afia and Kanita said, you know, Durham is a progressive place. And, you know, sometimes it's who you know. We, we found out uh, directly about these funds and were able to make connections because someone in city council made a phone call and said, y'all need to request some money. Y'all need to ask for something. And this is what we chose to do. But what demands do you have that you wanna make? So Kanita, I will, I will pass it back to you now. Okay, thank you, Nikki. Um, and yes, you are one of my bestest buds and favorite people on the planet as well. Love you, miss you, can't wait to see you again. Okay, now, um, <laughs> first thing I want everybody to, to just understand, it's like Nikki said, we, um, the organization was contacted by a local politician in our area to come apply for some of this money. Um, but overall, a lot of people didn't know this money even existed, that we had access to it and that we could even apply. So the first thing we're asking folks to do is just contact your local city and county, your city council and your county commissioners and ask them, send them an email. Go find out their information and send them an email. What are we doing with these ARPA funds? Have you all made decisions about them? Um, you know, how 
Are we, uh, are you all engaging in a process that includes um, collective uh, planning and, bar you know, collective um, action? Are you interested or, or what, what, how are you proposing to work with local agencies and organizations uh, in order to distribute this money? Um, and, and just ask them, you know, what are, what are they planning on doing? Um, I think that's the first thing. Um, what, we, what we have found is, is that our local, they're coming to us because they don't know what to do. They've never had anything like this happen. Uh, we haven't had anything like this happen since the New Deal, which is like our grandparents were children. So this, it's been a long time since anything like this has come down the pike. So, you know, we're just encouraging folks to reach out to your local politicians because they they want the help they need the help because they don't really know what they're doing <laughs> and so um if if you uh go out there and and tell ask them what their processes are and how they're doing things um then um i think that's one of the first things that's that's super important um the second thing is like you know, y'all read people. I'm just asking, please read. Um, go get that upper bill. It's in the chat. Um, I'm gonna um I think I can share my screen. Hold on, let me so I wanna show you all something. I'm gonna share my screen. Just give me a sec. Yeah. Okay, so um here is the ARPA bill that's in the chat. What I want everyone to see is this is, it's long, it's like 200 pages. So it's not like, and it's a lot of wherefore here that here to the owls and all that. But here, can you see my cursor here, y'all? Listen to this page. You can listen to this. So if you are, are visually impaired or you don't feel like reading all of it, you can click listen to this page and uh, you will be able to hear the bill. I think I saw a question earlier about will ARPA fund X. My suggestion to you is to get this PDF right here. Click on that. Click on that PDF. And then once you get that PDF up, I want you to hit, if you have a, um, a, a PC, you're going to hit Command F. If you, I mean, Control F. If you have a Mac, you're going to hit Command F. And what you can do when you hit that command F feature is, is look for, I'm gonna look for transformation. You can look in the bill for that word. It'll tell you how many times the word is in the bill. And so transformation, how about transform? Well, anyway, um, oh, we found it. There it is. Transform. So it's, it's, it's a lot of references to transform. So when you get to transform, you can just click on these little arrows and it'll take you through the document every time transform, transformation, any of those words appear. Um, and then let's see. Um, okay. I just want to make sure I'm hitting all the... Um, it's also really important to understand and know uh, your local history and uh, who, who were the players uh, during um, the, the last funding, what happened to the money, who received it, how does redlining impact your community, um, who are the folks who do get government and grant funding in your community? And what are they doing for the marginalized folks in your community? What impact has government uh, funding and grants had in your community? Who's running those funds? Are the people who are writing the funds part of those communities? Or are they folks who aren't part of the communities coming in telling the community what to do? And what is, is is unique about the ARPA funding is that it is set up so that folks who usually don't get that funding can get this funding in order to do transformational work within, within their communities. So um, that's the other thing is like, you know, just, just make sure you know um, your local history and understand uh, who is running things, how they've run things, um, 
what they've done with the money and how they've benefited the communities um, that you're interested in working with and helping if those communities have been helped or not. But you can do that with a lot of like just cursory research, asking, um, looking at um, historical data. If you all need help with that, um, you can shoot us an email. We'll be more than happy to help you figure out how, how to do that work. Um, so yeah, use the tools. Um, we have sent a um, we have sent a document of ARPA of ARPA information. It's a it's a Google Doc. It's full chock full of information, both about what we're doing on a local level as well as uh, historical stuff and and researching tips. Um, if you have any questions about that, please don't hesitate to reach out. But again. Look at that document. I'm pretty sure it's pretty. It's, it's, it refers to over a thousand pages of material. We don't expect you to read every single page, but we do ask that you just check it out. Look at how we've gathered the information. Look at the information we have, and then use that as kind of like a skeleton or a or a or a guide to create um, to replicate it in your own your own community. And finally, build that base. Um, who are the who are the um, folks in your community that are, um, who are, who are, who are leading the charge, who are doing transformational work and uh, can you build a base together to, to interface with your local politicians to ask about how they're planning on using these funds, who they're giving these funds to, and what transformational work is going to be done in your community. Um, so again, I'm gonna um, put in the chat the control F function, and um, I don't know that I can put I can tell I can put in the chat the listen function that's in the bill. Um, but um, yeah, so for a PC, I'm gonna put it in the chat for a PC um, in order to do a keyword search. It's um, control plus F. And then you type the word. And then for a Mac, it's uh, command plus F. And that's the way that you can do the keyword search within the bill. And you can find out you know, if there are certain things um, that it will fund. Um, but it's written pretty broadly to fund just about a lot. Um, I did see a question in the chat about have they um, have they uh, uh, distributed any funds in Durham? They have not, but the city's RFP process ended um, for the first set of monies on the 31st. And we are understanding that we have, for, for folks who received approval to go into the final stages of consideration for their uh, proposals to be considered, they have a list of questions that they must respond to, I think by the 11th. And I think like uh, Afia said earlier, the money has to be for this first pot has to be distributed uh, by um, the, the 20, by 2024. Um, and I'm not sure it's by the 10th. Okay. I'm not sure when um, we'll get a final decision about who's getting funded and who's not, but we do have a deadline for the folks who uh, made it to the final round of consideration for their um, RFPs for additional information. Um, one other thing that we noticed with this was that what the city requested on the front end, they actually wanted more information than what they asked for. And what we're finding as we look at the fallout from the folks who are getting to that final stage versus the folks who aren't, um, the, the folks who gave them the information that they asked for in the, in the rubric that they sent um, are having a little bit harder time getting their grants uh, proposals approved than the folks who sent in um, grant proposals that were like, you know, you're applying to the Soros Foundation or something. So that's the other thing, just understand, like make sure that you're working together to understand what, um, what your grant funding is gonna look like. Um, ooh, it's getting dark out here. What your grant funding is gonna look like, um, how they're gonna distribute it and what their criteria are gonna be then you can also hold them accountable around what they ask for versus what they fund based on the criteria that they give you. So, um, so basically, yeah, that's that's basically it. Now, does anyone have any other questions that I might I might be able to 
ask answer at this time or were there any questions in the chat that I didn't get to um just let me know um I noticed a question in the chat about what treasury allocation means would one of you like to that's how much money that's how much the treasury department um the U.S. Department of Treasury money people for it not they're given to your individual communities on the county and city level. Fort Knox. Yeah, Fort Knox. As I eat marzipan and forgot that I left my camera on. <laughs> so Marsha, I see your question. Um, I can't answer if they'll support your program directly. What I can say is, um, do that control F function, look through that bill to find keywords that are related to what, to what um, you, you're working on. How do you apply? Again, that's on the local level at your county and city. So that's why you have to um, understand or be engaged with your local politicians to understand what their process for the ARPA funds are. You know, we have two humongous counties in North Carolina, Mecklenburg and Wake which are two of the wealthiest um, counties in the state, but they're also two of the hardest counties in the nation to, tr to um, transition your economic status if you're poor. So if you're born poor in Mecklenburg and Wake County, the likelihood that you're gonna stay poor is extremely high. So when I went to Wake County to look at not just their allocation, but also what they're doing with the money, they don't have any public RFP requests for the, at the county or city level. I don't live in Wake County, so I wouldn't be able to request those funds. But if there's anyone in North Carolina who is living in Wake County, you have a right to contact your city and count, your city council and your county commissioners about what are they planning on doing with this money. Look at those large counties in the states that you live in. You know, find out are they having these types of pro? What are they doing? How are they distributing this money and what's the criteria that they're using for it? So Marsha, I would suggest that you interface with your local politicians in your city and county and ask them what they're doing with the ARPA funds, what their plans are, and get a, a broad base with your local organizations to challenge them if they're not being transparent about their process. We have a question about um, the participatory participatory budgeting process and if there's um, a connection between the ARPA funds and Durham's participatory budgeting process. Um, and there is a connection. Um, uh, some of the work around ARPA has come out of that process. And um, so there is some connection there. However, there are still disconnects between who is going, who knew about the, the funding and, um, and who is eligible to receive the funding. I think that we were one of the first groups of folks who, because we read the primary source documents, who pushed back to say that this broad was actually much broader than, um, than what they were, than what the city was articulating to us. And so that's what we want to make sure that you know and that you understand. The bill is very broad and the guidance that has been given to municipalities from the ICMA, as well as um, other policy sources and, and treasury sources has been, or let me just pull that back. Okay, let me just say, the guidance that has been given to a lot of municipalities has been to make sure that they approach this funding from a broad perspective and to fund transformational projects and to make sure that folks who don't normally get government funding get the funding. So there may be a disconnect there as far as uh, like a, a process or an administrative disconnect that um, involves making sure that people who don't normally get funding still get it. And that might be where your work lies is in that place. But the answer to that question is yes. So can I, can I say something real quickly? Yes. Hey everybody, it's Nia Wilson, Mama Nia Spirit House. Um, and I just, I wanted to sort of reiterate that, like your work really in this moment is to find out 
what this what your city or county has decided to do because in Durham they created a set of guidelines that did not come from the federal government they created their own guidelines which were much stricter than what the ARPA guidelines are and so some of what we have done and are doing is challenging them on that you know why are you using a stricter set of guidelines than what the federal government has actually outlined and that may be the first thing that you need to do and you but and that also some of that in some conversations that i've had is that that also in some degree depends on the state and how the state your particular state says that money can be used but a lot of folk are just uh, counties are just taking the money and applying it to already existing programs or or boosting like um, police um, in their communities and other programs that already exist and that is not what this money was meant for and if you don't challenge them that's what's going to happen and we're going to lose this pot of money the largest pot of money that has been um, infused into our municipalities since 1934. So there's a, um, thank you, Mama Nia. There's a question in the chat um, about, do you have to have, be fiscally sponsored or a nonprofit? The answer is no. ARPA funds are for individuals, organizations, and businesses. So if you're an individual, so I know, you know, there are some um, folks that are in our coalition um, who aren't like, like organizations. They're individuals who want to do programming in the community. They don't even have a financial structure yet, but they're still applying and have made it to the final stages. So no, you don't. Um, the next question is, what are the accountability channels to enforce that directive on who should get the money? And is there a federal oversight contact? I do not know about a federal oversight contact, but what I do know is that these are local officials. It's not the president of the United States. This is your county commissioner. This is your city council member. You can get their email. You can pick up the phone. You can call them. You can email them. And if it's enough people asking them these questions and you build a broad base of, I mean, we only started out, I think it was like maybe a dozen organizations when we started, if that many. And now it's just continued to grow. And so I'm just, I'm here to say, you know, you know, if you are a big tree, we are a small X, okay? And that's that's how you got to think about this. this. You know, turn to the book of Bob Marley. That's what he said. If you are a big tree, we are a small X. And that's how you need to, you need to look at this. This is a big tree. But a, a small X can take down a big tree if you just keep hacking at it. And this is something that, you know, you're going to have to continue to hack at. It's not going to be, it's not a chainsaw. It's a small X, it's, it's going to be, you know, it's, it's a lot of work, but at the end of the day, you just, you just, you do it. I mean, we had no idea. I mean, we're at SMA. We had no idea we would be here when we started writing this proposal. Like, honestly, we were just trying to do something for our local government officials. And we're already in front of SMA and we have, you know, other meetings that we're going to just because we took the time to do a little bit of research and, 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 and put some stuff together at the behest of, a, a local nonprofit in our area. And this is something that you all can do too. Yeah, I cannot make one tiny little point. Um, one of the things that was really helpful was making sure that we had um, the support and the help of people within academia. And, um, and, and the reason why that's important is because they're already doing research. They're already collecting data. And so you don't have to reinvent the wheel um, by going to these people. Um, the other piece is that, well, that was, that was the, the main piece, but you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are already people out there working on this and you can, all you have to do is tap into them. So y'all, we just want to thank Spirit House and the Back in the Black Coalition for an incredible presentation, an incredible campaign that they're running that, that they offered for us all to learn from. And so just definitely want to give really big, big, big props um, and appreciations for, for everybody tonight. 
Um, we are going to close out the call officially, but they have offered to stay on for another 15 minutes because we know all this information is fast and furious. Like Mama Nia said, some they, they have designed this to not have our communities know, to not have access to proposals and ways to redistribute these funds. So this is intervening on that process and creating a, a, a beautiful organizing guide for all of us to follow, even if there's going to be differences in every single county, every single place, there's going to be major differences that we're going to be up against, major hurdles and maybe major opportunities. We think that there's probably in smaller towns and rural communities, there might be more opportunities to go after some of this because because you might know the county commissioners by name and by relationship. That's the, that was the beginning of this process. Those long-term relationships that have been built over time with Spirit House, with Nia and others, that's how they found out about this and started to move very quickly, like they described, to make it an organizing drive, not just a proposal for funds, but an entire organizing process to intervene on the ARPA um, and to also build out a vision based and rooted in the historical understanding of the place and tying that into the current initiatives and making sure that it was relevant across the board. So we put into the chat, we'll, we'll close out um, with just deep gratitude and then open back up for some of the nitty gritty questions. There's three action steps in your um, chat and one, is to sign the petition. They asked us to, to share that with you all, to sign the petition to support the Back in the Black Coalition and their efforts to broaden that awareness for us to take this back to our own communities. Um, so if you're interested in a deeper dive on this, um, definitely let us know. Let's go, let's get deeper. Let's get into this and see if there's ways to support um, campaigns happening like this across the Southern region. Um, and just to make sure folks remember and know we are in the midst of our hot damn uh, freedom and survival some, uh, school and there's still time to register. We've got over 270 people registered for the hot damn study series. And it's a way to go deep on some of this. Um, and find out more. So thanks, Wendy, for popping it all into the chat. Um, big gratitude. And if folks have um, thank yous, throw them in the chat. And then we'll shift um, and just start. Keep, we'll keep talking details. We'll hear a little bit more. Um, if you've got more questions, we'll go scour the chat and make sure we can pop them up front. But just thank you all so much for sharing this and offering these tools and tips that we can all use in our communities. I just want to point out what Afia put in there about knowing your history, y'all. Like, you know, when you think about what's happening, and I mean, all of this is even connected to anti uh, critical race theory legislation that's across the United States right now. You know, this is really about a dumbing down of our civil process and our civil processes that continue to allow us to just accept whatever people tell us instead of engaging in a process where we're able to question and hold folks accountable. And so, you know, I just want to put out there that what if you said about understanding your history and knowing your history and doing just that little bit of investigation, just that little bit of research. And, you know, as, as Steph was saying, if you all want a deeper dive to, to figure out how to do this, we are more than happy to do that. We would love to show y'all some of the work that we do. we would love to you know, show folks how to do just cursory research. Google doesn't have all the answers, but it can get you some good information and get you started. So, you know, um, yeah, the history part is, is super important. So we didn't put it in our, um, in our proposal but the impact of take, for instance, the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1933, um, the Wagner Act of 1935, um, the history of the Tennessee Valley Authority, all of these, um, all of these things that happened in history that locked black people, um, largely black people and poor people out of government funding. We read that and we did we did the research on that. We didn't put it all in our proposal. We didn't put any of that, I don't think, in our proposal, but we did make sure that we articulated that <clears throat> that it is very clear that there were disparities and that those disparities um, um, are part of the reason why we have disparities today. So Citigroup GPS, um, released a report that stated that if racial equity 
gap, um, gaps have been closing, have been closed only 20 years ago, we would have added $16 trillion to our nation's GDP. Not black people's GDP, not white people's GDP, not anybody else's GDP, but our entire nation's GDP would have been $16 trillion more than it is now. So when you start to look at the real deal numbers, when you start to look at the historical data around how policies and laws were embedded into, um, into how funding was, was allocated back in the 1930s, and we are still to this day living with that, when you tie that back into how this funding um, is going to happen now, people start sitting up and they start listening to you because we have a bureaucracy. And so yes, people are not going to want to change necessarily all their administrative processes to, or break certain policies and, and to, in order to accommodate these funds. But at the end of the day, some of these things are going to have to change in order to get um, funds in the pockets of people who have been doing this work um, to come, who have sustained negative effects of COVID-19 and in order to do the work that they've been doing. I was wondering, Afia, just for clarity, um, I think folks got it, but you said that 38% of, of firms and businesses, as well as the population of Durham being 38% Black, why are you requesting 45% That's of the funding? Question. So asking for 38% would be an equity model. So I'm sorry, a um, equality model. So it's like the 38% of you know residents that are Black, we should have 38% of the funding. But um, we are working from an equity model and not an equality model, which is that we are asking for more because there are racial and um, racial disparities that um, have been there before this money came. And so that's why we are asking for the 45%. It was not an arbitrary or indiscriminate number. It was tied to the concept of equity as opposed to the concept of equality. Now, if the, if the funding goes out and if um, once they count uh, or you know, aggregate everything and count the data and all that other kind of stuff, and what they find is that less than 38% of um, businesses, organizations, and individuals that could have qualified for ARPA were Black, then we're talking about continuing to um, exacerbate and perpetuate the inequities that still exist. And so again, that is a talking point. That is a messaging that's important to put forward um, is that if we say we have multiple committees and task force and data and reports and all of this stuff, that talks about how we have to end this, this piece of having these gaps and having these inequities, then we can't continue to say that and then have these abysmal numbers come in, come out on the back end after the money is already spent, after the funding is already gone. So we're just trying to be proactive. We're just trying to get in on the front end to in, in terms of making sure that folks um, know about it ahead of time um, so that we don't look at a situation after the funding is gone where we still haven't allocated that funding equitably. Um, I just want to point out Matthew in the chat talked about an equity um, study that his county has done. That's a great place to start. That is actually the perfect place to start. If your county or your city has done an equity study, go get it. And then that's what you build your stuff off of because that's what those county commissioners and city council per people are going to want to hear about they're going to want to hear what have they what have they hired people to do and what have the people they hired said and then you say okay well this is what the people y'all hire have said and this money is here so what y'all gonna do about what they said 
that's where you get them. If you've had an equity study done in your county or your city, start there because we included that. That was one of our, that was one of the main uh, uh, resources we used to build our, our proposal upon was the equity study that was done here in Durham, in Durham County, Durham City. So absolutely, definitely use that. that. Thank you for saying that, Matthew, because that is definitely something uh, you should definitely, definitely, you can build around that. Um, we also, there was, there was a report that came out like right after, or I think it was like the day before we submitted that we hadn't seen um, just yet. So I'm also just, you know, encouraging folks to just make sure that you look far and wide for that information. And I think Rafia said something about um, local academicians too. Whatever local universities you have that are doing economic studies and looking at equity in your community, those are also folks you can reach out to. Um, and yeah, so I would just say use those folks too. Okay. Data. How do I, from a, you live in a small rural town in South Georgia. How do you take a deep dive into the county and town history? Um, what's your closest university and what does their digital archive look like? And do you have a historical foundation in your city? If so, what is it? Um, who are the elders in your community and what do they know? Um, do you have relatives or, um, or community members that you're close to who are over 50? Uh, pick their brains and find out because sometimes in these small rural towns, we don't, we don't, we don't get, we don't see what it's got, as the Godfather will say, what's up under their fingernails, and like what's, what's in there, you know what I mean, um, so I would say, I would start with your um, local university and their archive, then I would find um, historical foundations or associations or societies, I would also talk to elders in the community, and then, um, I guess the last thing, you know, would just be um, what are the um, what are the history uh, resources within your local community? Here we have a um, there's an archive at the public library specifically about Durham. There are archives specifically about Black Durham. Um, uh, find out if there have been um, books um, written by local folks about your local community. Um, if there have been, um, you know, certain um, uh, hot damn topics that have <laughs> happened in your community, like, you know, you find out about hot damn what's that, you know, like, is there something like that that's occurred in your community? And where do you find, you know, a lot of research that I find is, is serendipity, honestly. It's like you get, you get a, a nugget and then you just follow it until you find out more and more and more. Um, and I would also say just, um, you know, I don't know if your public libraries are open, but your librarians are probably available by email or chat or some kind of way. Um, figure out how to contact a local librarian, either at a local university or a public library and ask them, how do I find out more about my town? Um, one thing about data, it, I wanted to make sure that I said this about data collection and data reporting. Um, it's important how the data is analyzed around who gets what. Um, and that was why we put in our report that, um, that, well, there was one organization in particular called Cape Fear Collective. And one of the things that's happening now is that um, there, folks are using what's called a regression analyses, um, which means that, you know, normally we, we take these two things and we say this one thing, A, impacts this other thing, B. But what a regression analysis does is it takes multiple things, right? It takes, um, you know, X, Y, Z, R, Q, and the, all of those things impact B. And that's important because when we start talking about like, well, you know, I'm not just um, a person who identifies as Black, 
I'm a person who identifies as a woman, as queer, as a mother, as um, a graduate of an HBCU um, three times over, as, 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 right? There are all of these things. And there are all of, the, all of these things, especially as an information professional. For example, I've graduated from HBCU. That could impact my salary, you know? that as opposed to graduating from a, a predominantly white school. So there, there are multiple things, um, that's just my one little example, but there are multiple things that impact what the one thing. And so it's important when you're looking at who's collecting the data and how are they um, aggregating that data and how are they reporting out that data, it's important to understand who is doing it, how are they doing it, and what types of tools and analyses are they using in order to do that? I think we're at time, y'all. I wanna thank everybody for um, um, coming out. And yes, PG, getting a trained statistician is important, but you also wanna make sure, just like folks who write algorithms, have an understanding of the community you're dealing with and you're talking about. You know, you want to make sure that the person that that are is collecting the data understands the people that the data is being collected about, because it's just like how their algorithms written that can't recognize black faces. You know, there's a reason for that. And there are a lot of data collectors out here who don't recognize the, the BIPOC experience <laughs> because they just it's not on their radar. So that's the only caveat I would have for that. But um, we want to thank you all for coming out. Thank you for your support. And if y'all do need a deeper dive, you know, hit us up, hit up, hit up Steph, let her, let them know, cause let, let them, let them know. Cause you know, we, we, we ready. We stay ready. Thank y'all spirit house folks can come off mute. Um, just so, so grateful that you are doing the work and that you were willing and so generous to share the work so that we can learn from it. So we can apply it in our communities. Um, and yeah, and, and we're, if folks are really interested in diving into this, uh, we will uh, follow up with you and, and start to, to start to figure out how to coordinate. Each one's going to be a little different, but that's what the SMA is built to do, is to support and coordinate across local power building efforts. Um, so this is just extremely exciting to be able to, to support and amplify y'all's work tonight. Um, thank you, Afia, Kanita, Nikki, Mia. Um, my hunter, everybody uh, who's up there. And um, and thank you, Wendy and the interpreters for rolling with us a little extra on the bonus round. And, um, and thank you all for being here. We will follow you up. We can come off mute and say good night. Good night, y'all. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good thank y'all so much. Thank have you. a good night. Thank you. Got <laughs> the recording and all the links, y'all. Check out their seven-page proposal. It's fire. It gives all the information. And thank y'all. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night, y'all.